Hi everyone, today I'm going to share with you a few tips when you're working with Photolab 6 Elite. Now this is primarily aimed at beginners, but Photolab has been my primary editor of choice for the last couple of years now because ultimately I think it gives the best results from your raw images. Now if you haven't tried Photolab 6 Elite for yourself, I'll have my affiliate links down below where you can download a free trial and see if it's the right editor for you. In today's video, I'm going to go over how I import and organize my photos in Photolab, and then we're also going to look into the Preferences tab and see what things we can tweak so we can get a little better performance. All right, let's start in the photo library where we get a list of folders starting with my PC and all of the hard drives attached to it. And I'm just going to give you an idea of how I, how I organize things. It may not be necessarily how you do it, but because Photolab doesn't have a direct way to import your images, uh, you need to come up with a folder structure uh, that works for you. Uh, so what I like to do is I have a working hard drive here that I keep current. And within this hard drive, I have uh, my clients folder. This is my media folder where I keep all of my images and videos. This video, these are del uh, delivered videos that I use for either my classes uh, or personal stuff. And then I have my published videos. This is for like YouTube, for example. Uh, and then within the media folder, uh, I like to organize things by chronologically primarily so we have the year and then within the year I have each quarter and then within each quarter I have each individual day of photos and then for each individual day I like to add a little description of what's in that folder so I don't have to actually open it up to see what's in it now, I have additional folders here that really can't be put in chronologically like my astrophotography you know I have it broken down by camera then within camera I have it broken down by file type within file type by ISO, by length. You know, this is kind of specialized stuff. Uh, but for 99% of my photography, I break it down chronologically like this. Now, as I was saying that DxO doesn't have a direct import feature. As you can see, we have lots of export options, but no way to import the images. So what I like to use is Adobe Bridge. And after I insert my SD card into my computer, I just click on the uh, camera icon here and then select the SD card. And then over here for location, I pick the hard drive. So I have media 2023, first quarter, and it automatically fills in today's date uh, because I have the create subfolder here. And then you can also rename the files, which I don't do very often, and then some basic metadata. So let's go ahead and click uh, get media. And you can see it's importing everything here. Just so you can see 38 files just take a minute okay let's go back into uh photo lab and if i go into 2023 first quarter scroll all the way down here you can see that it automatically created the subfolder uh, by day and then i'll just right click on this and i'll do a uh, rename folder and type in ellie my dog like so all right, now that we have all our files in, let's go into the preferences here. And I'm gonna show you everything that I have set up here and why. So basically, uh, yeah, I'm gonna be using English and we're gonna display the plugin because I do have the NIC collection. And then correction settings can be saved separately. This is for the non-destructive workflow. And then when you import the images uh, or after it discovers images, you can have it automatically apply a preset to that image. However, I like to set uh, no correction for both RAW and RGB because I'm going to be doing all of the uh, editing myself. I don't want to apply a preset on import. However, this can be useful if you're importing a certain type of image and you know exactly what kind of preset you want to apply. But uh, generally speaking, um, DxO will work faster overall uh, when you have this set to no correction settings. And I also uncheck these two boxes. If you have a Fuji camera and you'd like to see the Fuji colors, uh, you can check this box. But again, I like to keep everything off because I'll do all the editing myself. Now the Photolab database, uh, by default, it goes into, for Windows anyway, it goes into this uh, app data folder. And uh, this is, uh, you don't really need to change this, but it's good to know where it is in case you like to do uh, backups of your hard drives. Uh, you can include this folder as part of your backup, which is something that I do. All right, in the display tab, uh, I like to have the background color when I'm editing in 
in black uh, but you can change this to another color but I like to have this in black and then the soft proofing color uh, which is the you know how you can preview the output of your edit uh, I have that set to white because a lot of the images I export uh, to uh, display on Instagram and Instagram has a white background. So when I use a white background, you know, I can get a feel for if the image is going to look too dark against the white background or not. Uh, this one here, I also uncheck this. I think it's checked by default. Uh, and what this will do is when, when DxO detects a new camera and lens combination, that, can, that it can support, uh, it's going to prompt you, do you want to download the optics module for it if it hasn't been done already? And I turn this off because it interrupts my workflow. And sometimes it can take a while uh, for the DxO optics module to download. So I'd rather do that separately on an image if I need to. And when I'm ready, um, I don't like it to just automatically pop up. I also uncheck this preview high quality. Uh, again, this will slow down the overall performance. So I leave this unchecked. Uh, and then show images and enclose projects. Uh, that's for project groups. We'll talk about that in another video. And then uh, overlay grid size. I have mine set to 40. And this is basically, I'll show you what this is for. If I open up this image and I overlay a grid, this is the grid set. I guess this is 40 pixels, whatever that 40 represents. But if I change it to say, you know, 100, you can see that the grids are just bigger. So uh, I do a lot of architectural work. So I like to have my grid set pretty tight at uh, 40, you know, right, right in this range here. And then the image browser section, this is all of the type of statuses and indicators for the individual thumbnails. And I make sure all of these are on, except for this one, which you can't see, but it says info panel. Uh, I like to keep this always off. Uh, but let me turn it on for now, just so you can see what it does. But when I'm in my library and I hover my mouse over an image, you can see this little pop up here. Really, I don't need to see this because I have all that information over here on the right. So that's why I turn that off. So I'm going to go in here, display. And I'm going to turn that to always off. But I like to have everything on. The processing status, the file name, any tags and ratings, and DxO optic status. So you can see here I have my star ratings, my pick or unpick image, uh, delete button. So th this is what we're checking so that we can see everything. And uh, this is the optics module. So this is telling me that no DX optics module is available because... I was using an adapted lens here. All right, let's go back into the preferences and look at the metadata tab. And I make sure these two are checked. Uh, this is part of your non-destructive workflow. So you need these files to be checked and synced. And then assigning keywords, I just select whole hierarchy of selected keywords so that all the keywords I might assign will be uh, saved. And then under performance, you can put this on auto. Or for me, I like to specifically set the... Uh, graphics card to do the processing for the deep prime um, that way you get a little better performance and then for cache I just I use a pretty big cache uh, you can slide this up and down and change that and once in a blue moon I'll clear the cache just to keep things kind of tidy and then by default uh, again your cache folder saved on to your app data folder in Windows uh, and you can change this if you want to put this on a faster drive uh, in, in my case, my C drive is my fastest drive, the SSD uh, in the laptop. So I'll just leave this at its default setting. But uh, you can change this if you want a little better performance to an SSD drive. And then OpenCL. Uh, this is another uh, processing. This is more in your processor or CPU. Uh, just leave this at 2. You can set it higher. So basically, like when you're exporting, say, 10 images, it'll do it two at a time uh, versus you know, you can set this higher and it'll try and export all 10 at a time. Or in this case, I have 14 selected, but uh, two is a good number and we're done. All right, another thing I want to show you is under the help tab here. So we have the online user guide or you can go to the hub or online support and download the user guide if you want to look at it without having to be online. 
but uh, the shortcuts uh, help here. This will show you all of the different shortcut keys that you can use to activate certain, certain features or to view things differently. The one that I use the most is the F9 key. So if I hit F9, it closes the side panel so I get a little more real estate for my thumbnails. Or if I'm working on an image, if I hit the F9 key, it gives me a little more real estate to work with the image itself. And then I can just toggle that on and off by hitting the F9 key like so. And then the other one I use a lot is Control G, where I can turn the grids on and off like so. All right, that's all I have for today, but I do have a lot more tutorials coming, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for those. And if you found this video helpful, consider buying me a coffee or making a small donation in the links below. I appreciate you watching, and I hope to see you again soon.